Okay, very pleased to start our second section here. I'm also pleased to introduce Jean-Marc Deval. <laughs> <laughs> I've been practicing it for a while. Um, he is professor of applied linguistics and multilingualism. He has an MA uh, in French and Spanish. I know you didn't say this, but I looked you up. Oh. I Googled you. <laughs> an MA in European international law, an MA in Eastern European affairs, and a PhD in romance languages and literature. And that's why he speaks Spanish so well. Um, he works at, as we can see here, uh, as Professor of Applied Linguistics and Multilingualism at Burbeck. He is the author of Emotions in Multiple Languages, 2010, uh, and a second edition last year, right, 2013, mm. which Laura was showing us yesterday. He's the former president of the European Second Language Association current vice president of the International Association of Multilingualism, general editor of the International Journal of Bilingual Education and Bilingualism. I wonder how you got any research done with all this. Yeah, you wonder. I do <laughs> wonder. <laughs> um, Jean-Marc's teaching and research interests cover a wide range, including of subjects, including multilingualism, multiculturalism. I think there's a section in your book about mm. um, different uh, identities and personalities in speaking different languages, um, psychological aspects of second and foreign language acquisition and production. He is specifically interested in individual differences in foreign language acquisition and multilingualism. He has focused on sociolinguistic and sociopragmatic competence, We'll forget about other ideas of competence and uh, the on the communication of emotions in a variety of languages and contexts. So, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. <laughs> well, th thank you for uh, introducing me so kindly. Thank you to. Um, have uh, invited me, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, in fact, I realized I've been here once before when uh, UNED uh, organized um, an um, ASLA uh, conference uh, some time ago, and, and, and I remember having presented something because it was the only other time I've been to Madrid, so this was a nice second opportunity uh, to come to you. Um, before I start my presentation, I would like to, to, to quickly tell you why I got interested in emotion. Um, I started, I did my PhD on second language acquisition, the acquisition of French uh, by Flemish students at the University uh, of Brussels who typically also knew English, German, sometimes Spanish. Uh, French was typically their second language and I looked at how they, their interlanguage uh, developed. And um, I, so I looked at uh, morphology and syntax and uh, grammar and uh, gender agreement in French, and all that was pretty interesting, but in the end I thought uh, s slightly boring in the sense that you, 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 you get bogged down in the one domain and, and you think, okay, m maybe there is more to life than just looking at the development you know, or, or gender agreement. And I guess it was also a, a discussion I had with an aunt who asked me, so what is it that you're doing? And, and she, she works in palliative care. <laughs> Yeah, so she said, oh, you know, yeah, I teach French and I do research on, on uh, I ask myself, you know, why is it that sometimes people uh, who learn French make gender agreement at the start of the sentence and then they don't at the end of the sentence? And as I was explaining it, I, I kind of realized that it fell short of her expectation. <laughs> so, so she said, ah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and so she, she said very kindly, isn't that hair splitting? <laughs> And, 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 and I laughed and I said, well, I agree, you know, in a way you, you could say that this is hair splitting. I find this interesting and I get paid for it, but I, I, it, it felt like a kind of a feeble justification. Um, so although I, I totally agree that we should be able to do research on that uh, and it does not necessarily need to have an impact, um, then suddenly 9-11 happened um, and that again uh, made me think about what is it that as applied linguists we can do 
uh, to society to, in fact, try and have some positive effect on society. And the understanding of gender agreement will have little effect, uh, I think. And, and, and I was thinking that it, it would be nice, in fact, to expand the research where, we can, where I could do stuff that is more socially uh, relevant. And um, at the time, uh, I, I had come across a, a paper by Aneta Pavlenko. Um, in, um, it was in bilingualism, language, and cognition. And um, I missed her talk uh, at a second international symposium um, on bilingualism in Newcastle. And she missed my talk. So we didn't talk to each other. <laughs> and, and relationships sometimes can start by missing each other's talk. Because I emailed her afterwards. I said, you know, I noticed you, you mentioned uh, emotion. Uh, in your uh, abstract, and I'm so sorry I missed your talk. And she said, well, sorry for having missed yours, um, but maybe we could do something on emotion. I said, yeah, because one of the things I noticed when I recorded uh, conversations I had with my students recording their French into language, that um, so some seem to be using more emotion words than others, and I'm quite interested in these individual differences. And she said, well, yeah, that's an interesting idea because I have this Russian-English interlanguage and, and, and I, I noticed kind of similar things that not everybody talks about emotion that much. And, uh, and, and so we said, yeah, well, maybe we could write a paper on this. And so I sent her a first version of, of the paper and, and then after, you know, 10 or 12 versions, we submitted it to language learning and, and it got published in 2002 under the title Emotion Vocabulary in Interlanguage. And at the time, I was quite surprised to find that there was, in fact, very little on emotion in second languages. Um, because I thought that in prag you know, pragmatic research, into language pragmatics, that there would be more on emotion. But they, it's typically not the kind of category that they were interested in. They were interested in specific speech acts, some of which could be emotional, but not in emotional in, in a more general sense. Um, then I had never met uh, Aneta so when the paper got accepted, which was the, the, the moment. It was also before we had pictures of ourselves on, web uh, on websites, right? <laughs> so, so we had this blind date moment. Uh, <laughs> and I've never done blind dating. I mean, this was the only blind date I've ever had uh, in, in my life. My wife wasn't happy about it, by the way. Um, and uh, as I said, uh, we, we agreed that we would meet at a pragmatics conference in Budapest uh, in 2000. And, um, uh, and I said, yeah, but by the way, what, what do you look like? <laughs> <laughs> Damn. I, I've, I had never been asked that I don't do that kind of stuff. So, so I said, the, the only thing I could come up with, oh, I don't look serious. Um, um, uh, and, 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 and she said, and what do you look like? And, and she said, well, you, you know, I'm red haired and, and, and I'm not that slim. I thought, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't mind, but, but that, then that, that, that's her. Uh, so, so, uh, so, so yeah, she's great. Um, so so, so we, get, we, we, we became good friends and we, we organized lots of things on um, um, second language acquisition, multilingualism and emotion. And uh, we, we also realized that it would be really great to bring people in with different perspectives. And that's why we brought in cognitive uh, psychologists. We brought in uh, people who work on autobiographical memories um, in uh, immigrants. Uh, and in fact, pe people using very different methods and having uh, a, a common interest, but, but through different approaches. And I think that's why I, I like the, y your project, because that's exactly what you want to do, have people with different uh, methods and, and perspectives. So, um, and, and I think we, we, we kind of uh, succeeded in, in uh, explaining why uh, emotion research uh, is relevant for our field, but is also relevant outside our field and is in fact relevant for, for um, the DOS implications at the level of society. And I will uh, show you some of that um, later on. But first, it's good to define what we are talking about. So multilinguals, uh, we, we used to have um, very restrictive definitions of bilinguals and multilinguals where you had to be native to be in, in both languages in order to call yourself a bilingual. Those were the 50s, the 60s. These days, 
um, linguists are, are much more tolerant that you, you need to have some competence in the foreign language. Uh, you, you might even just have receptive competence uh, in the foreign language. Um, so um, the, the definition by Aronet and Singleton uh, reflects current thinking on who can call uh, him or herself uh, multilingual. Uh, the other crucial aspect here is uh, social pragmatic, pragmatic, or even social linguistic competence, um, which uh, I, I quite like the definition by Casper and Rose on the social perceptions uh, underlying uh, participants' interpretation, performance of communicative action, so they are able to interpret what happens uh, and um, they, 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 they know what is expected and whether or not this conforms to the expectation. Um, and it's quite closely linked to pragmatic competence. Again, the linguistic resources that you have in a language to uh, realize particular elocutions. You know in what sequence uh, speech acts uh, are, are expected to be produced. You know about the appropriate contextual use of particular linguistic resources all those things that you think are, are pretty straightforward until you start learning a foreign language and you realize, oh damn, this isn't easy at all. And this is in fact typically the, the, the kind of the last, you know, once you've mastered the, the gender of the words and the grammar rules, then you suddenly realize, ooh, there is much more out there. And, and it, it's the woo moment that I had uh, when I joined um, Birkbeck in 1994. And, uh, you know, I was perfectly able to understand the BBC news and to read newspapers and books in English, but I was not prepared uh, for staff meetings. Because staff meetings, as you know, are places where uh, pragmatic competence is absolutely crucial. You are constantly being manipulated into saying yes to do things and, and, and you have to be very polite in saying no, I won't do them, but in a way that is socially uh, acceptable. So, so that, that was a, a kind of a wake up call for me that my uh, pragmatic competence in English uh, was, was really insufficient. Uh, namely when I had suggested, that, you know, they had asked me to look at um, the entrance uh, exam or entrance test for candidates wanting to do French. And, and I thought, yeah, sure, we could, you know, I'll present a way to do this much more quickly and efficiently by using Paul Miara's test, um, Lex, uh, vocabulary test, where you have to distinguish uh, real words from non-words in a language and you do about 100 of them at free, different frequency levels. And so I presented that enthusiastically to my colleagues who had never used a computer in their lives. <laughs> and and, and uh, the head of department said, interesting. <laughs> And I naively thought, oh, okay, so that's, that's okay then. So, so, no, you know, that was it. And we never seemed to vote on anything. So, so, after, the, so after the meeting, I, I go to the head of the department and say, you know, can I implement this now? I say, oh, no, of course not. <laughs> and I stupidly ask, Did, didn't you say it was interesting? I say, exactly, interesting. <laughs> And then I realized, okay, so that, that apparently positive emotion word, in fact, means just the opposite. It, with a certain intonation, had it been interesting, that might have been more committed. But interesting is really F, F off in a polite uh, academic uh, context. Uh, so so that, that's when I went through a silent period at uh, staff <laughs> meetings. I, I, I didn't speak for, for a year. And then afterwards, I, re I realized that since they all knew French, and French was my L1 and their foreign language, uh, I, I used French. Uh, which put them on the defensive because then I was better able to manipulate uh, <laughs> pragmatic meaning. So uh, that's uh, the, the joke. Okay, um, Anita came up with a, a very nice definition of uh, emotion concepts, uh, referring to both biological, social cultural elements, prototypical scripts formed as a result of repeated experiences. And that's obviously the thing that I did not have uh, when I arrived in England. I didn't have these repeated experiences of using English in context. Uh, I was, uh, and, and if you listen to the news or you read the book, it, it's a different kind of interaction uh, that you have. So uh, it involves causal antecedents, appraisals, as uh, Jeff um, said earlier, uh, but also physiological reactions. Your heart starts beating faster when you hear uh, or, or you say certain things, uh, means of regulation and display, they are embedded uh, in 
larger systems of belief about psychological social processes. Um, also, the fact that you have different contexts in different languages doesn't mean that uh, the users of these languages have different physiological uh, experiences, but they have different vantage points. Uh, and, and they may focus on slightly different aspects uh, of um, the, the, the interaction and, and interpret them slightly uh, differently. Okay, so the next one is something we discussed uh, yesterday, the basic emotions. Uh, is there such a thing as uh, basic emotions? Um, what are the six basic emotions? And um, well, it's clear that there are continua, but it's not entirely clear um, wh whether sleep is really uh, an emotion. Um, <laughs> <laughs> very pleasant one. It's an interdisciplinary topic in the sense that you, you, you can come at it from different angles. And th there is this brilliant center at the University of Geneva, um, the Effective Sciences uh, Center there. And, and on their website, they say, emotions play an important part in almost all areas of our lives, health, school, courtroom, politics, arts, economic life, sport. What triggers it? How do we control it? Um, how do they influence interpersonal relations, social interactions? So excellent uh, questions. And the people uh, belonging to that institute come from various disciplines. And, and it's really fascinating. You know, some, some of them uh, are, are historians and they look at how emotions are represented uh, in, in different uh, periods uh, in different countries. And, and, and it's enlightening. Uh, you know, the, I thought, oh, yeah, what an interesting idea. Um, behavioral analysis, uh, obviously also linguists and corpus linguists looking at how emotion words uh, are, are used uh, in different media, um, but paraverbal, um, nonverbal, um, physiological measurements with heart rates or, or, or pers uh, perspiration, um, even brain people looking at how brains react to emotional uh, stimuli. So all, all that is, is really uh, fascinating stuff. Um, but all that is relatively scientific in the sense that th they are people looking at books or people uh, recording data through lab uh, experiments. And uh, Wirzbika and her daughter, Mary Besemeres, said, well, we should also include other types of data, uh, bilinguals talking about their own experiences or writing about their own experiences. And uh, I guess the, the book by um, Eva Hoffmann, Lost in Translation, is a nice example of talking about the process of acculturation and emotion, the emotions that come with it. Um, and, and identity issues that come up. Who are you when you are using your foreign language, et cetera? So uh, Wirzbika says, you know, every opinion, uh, it, it's not true that every opinion is authoritative, but um, we, we need to take those testimonies uh, into uh, account, and, and it's a nice compliment. And uh, Besemeres, uh, who, who, who takes a slightly more radical position, saying, you know, um, we, we, we can learn as much talking to bilinguals uh, rather than just measuring them or recording data from them. So um, uh, Aneta and I both agree that it, it is nice to have what is called here this emic uh, perspective, that you have a participant's view specifically on things like emotions, because uh, as you said, the, the, there is always a question about uh, intentionality. Um, you, you, the, the, there is so much that, that goes on, and it's so subtle, and it's so messy, that in fact you, you need to ask people, why is it that you said that, or why is it that you wrote that? Or, um, and, and then you can have, you know, oh, I thought this was expected of me. Because when reading um, you, you, the, the, the film review by the Russian, that it, it was so obvious that that would not have been published in a British um, newspaper. Uh, so so it's, it's very culturally determined also on what is considered appropriate and, and what would be over the top. And if you are a reviews editor like you are, uh, then you know that sometimes we get reviews, because I've been review editor, you sometimes get reviews that are too emotional. And then you, you have to tell the author, you know, this is too emotional. This won't work for, for an academic journal. Um, you, you have to tone it down and, and make it uh, slightly more uh, impersonal. Uh, so those are the, 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 the books. Um, you, you mentioned mine and Aneta's book uh, that came out in 2005. 
And um, wh when I talk about emotions, I'm really interested in two different aspects. Uh, one is uh, all the affect linked to the use and the learning of a foreign language. The other aspect is, in fact, the expression or the recognition of emotion by uh, multilinguals uh, in their different languages and comparing how they use their different languages to uh, express uh, emotions in. Then um, your very own Jane Arnold in Sevilla has done excellent work on um, affect. Uh, she published a, a book in 99 uh, that was really um, groundbreaking, I think. And um, in a special issue to which I contributed in 2011, she, she said that positive affect is fuel and a negative affect is like cold water. So, so uh, emotion is, is a crucial part of second language uh, acquisition. Um, also, you will agree with me that in order to, um, for, for your students to learn something, they need to be in a kind of positive uh, environment. Uh, and that progress is linked not just to the relationship between teacher and learners, but also learners between themselves. And um, obviously you want a teacher to have uh, the ability to communicate freely, to be positive, uh, create a supportive, caring, emotional uh, environment. Um, and that doesn't mean that you can't challenge people. <laughs> Um, but, uh, and it's good for them probably also to be fearful sometimes, but you, 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 you need a general positive uh, atmosphere. And um, it's also the atmosphere where you could have people, you can bring people to a state of flow, where they forget uh, where they are and what time it is. And this is particularly relevant to me because at Birkbeck we teach in the evening. Uh, and I, I have taught Friday evenings from six to nine for many years. And I assure you that if you don't get your students in a state of flow, you, you know, then it's shipwreck. So, so, so you, you try to have them in flow until five to nine, and then you say, okay, guys, I think this is it for, for this week, you know, uh, have a nice weekend. And then suddenly everybody crashes out of flow and, and, and suddenly feels, oh, God, I'm hungry. Oh, God, I'm thirsty. Oh, God, I'm tired. And, and everybody limps home. Um, so um, you, you, you have to... Um, make people enjoy uh, the class. So um, with Peter McIntyre, we've looked at the variation in foreign language enjoyment and anxiety, also at Flow. We used an online questionnaire, and I think that some of you filled out a questionnaire or forwarded uh, the, the link, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, and, and one of the things we um, found was that negative emotions are not always bad, that in fact, uh, having emotions in a class, both positive and negative, are better than no emotions. No emotions means indifference, sleeping students. That, that's not good. If your students are protesting, well, you know, or, or, or they, are, they are fearful, uh, well, you, you, you try and encourage them to be less fearful, but, but to engage, and, and uh, you, you create the atmosphere where, where that's possible. Um, so positive emotions obviously are crucial, especially also to make um, your students more resilient um, so that they can overcome difficulties. We found some interesting gender differences uh, with our female participants um, scoring both higher on enjoyment but also higher on anxiety, um, which was kind of unexpected and the kind of politically incorrect finding. And so we are having some trouble in trying to publish a paper on the gender differences because the, we, we have some feminist reviewers who think that that's absolutely rubbish or the effect is too small to warrant a publication. And okay. Um, uh, also, we, we found that foreign language enjoyment seems to have a small but significant effect on positive flow. So if you enjoy it, then you, you're more likely to be in positive flow. Uh, but it didn't seem to have an effect on uh, negative uh, flow. Now, you'll agree with me. I mean, you wouldn't be sitting here if you didn't agree with this statement by Susan Fussell, an American psychologist who says that interpersonal communication of uh, emotional states is crucial. Every day in clinical interaction, uh, we love to talk about emotions uh, and share them. And how well these emotions are expressed, understood, is, is crucial for interpersonal uh, relationships and individual well-being. Uh, I've, put, I've highlighted that because she wasn't at all thinking about multilinguals, but I was thinking straight away about study abroad and uh, students during the first weeks of study abroad. 
where they have the kind of experience that I had when I joined the department and they are used to being funny uh, back home and then suddenly they can't be funny uh, in their foreign language. Or, or, or you know, they, they, they can be witty uh, with language in their first language and they suddenly realize that, that they come across or feel that they come across as clumsy idiots. And, and it, it typically takes a couple of weeks before they catch on and, and, and you know, establish a kind of a new persona in the second language that more or less coincides with, with the view they have of themselves uh, in their first language. So I thought, right, th th this is uh, pretty important. Um, also, it's difficult to talk about complex emotions and some people are very bad uh, at it in their first language. So, so let alone talking about this uh, in a uh, second, third, or, 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 or further language. I, I remember falling in love with a beautiful Madrilin uh, woman from Madrid uh, in um, Malaga. And one of the reasons I was falling in love with her was that I couldn't understand the people from the south of Spain. <laughs> and and uh, the, the, he, hearing uh, Spanish from Madrid was, was such a relief. So, so I kind of... I, I, yeah, I stayed with her and I wanted to impress her and I thought, I, and I realized that my verbal repertoire did not allow me to, to, to say anything remotely interesting. Uh, I could say the coffee is cold and, uh, and uh, quiero más vino tinto. Uh, uh, and, 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 and it, you know, it didn't work out, you know, we, 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 we were friends, but it didn't go beyond that. So, so, so I thought if only my Spanish teacher ha had, you know, provided me with scripts on how to impress a woman from Madrid. <laughs> Maybe that was asking a bit too much, I guess. Maybe it wasn't just to do with my language. I have to accept that too. Um, okay, so why um, I is it um, hard uh, to talk about emotions in a foreign language? And I think that um, if you are talking as a, in your first language with another speaker of that first language, you don't have to worry at all about grammar, vocabulary, metaphors, it all comes to you. Um, if you are using a foreign language and you are talking to another foreign language user or native speaker of that language, you have to look for gender agreements, you have to look for grammar rules and pragmatics, and you, you, you don't have sufficient space or resources to focus on the reaction you're getting from your interlocutor. I mean, you are inward looking at your internal grammar, yeah? And so you, you, you don't notice that your interlocutor is getting bored with you uh, or, or, yeah. And, and so you, you, you risk stumbling, you risk embarrassing yourself, which is never good. And so it's, a, it's, a, it's very tricky. Now, the other thing also is to know wh when, how to express an emotion um, appropriately. And that obviously depends on where you are, uh, who the interlocutor is, what exactly the topic of the conversation is. And uh, I, I like this uh, quote by Zheng Dao Ye, Chinese scholar who immigrated to Australia and um, who says, struggles with how um, well, Americans and Australians use the I love you uh, so, so often in terms of endearment. And she says, you know, my sense of self is Chinese. I feel most at home when I can express myself without words, in the Chinese way, subtle. Uh, and, and, and we Westerners seem to be using too many emotion words um, for uh, what compared to um, our uh, Asian colleagues. Now, it's pretty hard to recognize emotion. Um, and um, th this is, again, something that happened to me as I had been um, teaching a song uh, at the university in Brussels, and it was a, a, a rowdy song with vulgar words. And I, I think I, I quite enjoyed at the time to shock people a little bit. Uh, I, I still do that, but through, through academic analysis of swearing. Um, so, so there it was a, a, a song and everybody was singing along, and except one man who was sitting there, uh, he was Pakistani, and he clearly did not seem to enjoy the song at all. So everybody was laughing, laughing, singing along, and he was sitting there stiff, looking at me, not smiling. So I had, um, the door was there, so I had opened the door just, you know, so that I could jump out of the classroom <laughs> if necessary. And uh, after class, uh, everybody gets up and they leave the room and they sing and they're uh, everybody very happy. And he stays behind, then he gets up. And so I was kind of <laughs> moving backwards a little bit. 
and he comes to me and then with, with his hand like this, and then opens the hand, shakes my hand, says, great class, sir, thank you very much, <laughs> and walks out. <sighs> right. So I had obviously not recognized the emotion that he was uh, uh, experiencing. So th there weren't any verbal cues. Uh, th there wasn't any vocal cue because he didn't say anything. He didn't sing. Um, and, and I misinterpreted the visual cues because what maybe, you know, and I couldn't generalize that to all Pakistani. Maybe that was just one guy who was very stiff upper lip. I don't know. Um, but obviously, we, we learn from the facial expressions. Um, I, is it biology rather than culture? That, that's what Ekman thinks. So you have universal uh, basic uh, emotions. Um, uh, uh, other psychologists seem to think that you, people from uh, the sharing the same culture recognize each other's emotions much more easily, much more quickly. Uh, so the, the, it's a more cultural specific uh, thing, uh, and my own view uh, is, is that there is pro probably something universal and probably also something culture specific. And I have students working on Polish culture specific emotions or Japanese culture specific emotions, and it's interesting then to see how, as you acculturate, you, you, you become better at recognizing local uh, emotions. Um, this is important in the sense that it can have economic consequences. And, and this is an interesting recent study on service providers' perceptions of emotional expression of anger, fear, shame, happiness of customers coming from uh, Anglo countries and from Confucian Asian uh, countries. And so they watched video vignettes uh, from, uh, of customers complaining. Uh, they didn't hear any sound and they had to assess the emotional state of the person. And uh, it turned out that in culturally matched dyads, recognition was much better. So it, it, it's much harder if you're an Anglo person to recognize a Confucian Asian being angry and vice versa. Um, also, happiness was misread in uh, culturally both mismatched and matched dyads. So Happy, it's hard to see whether the customer is happy, apparently. Um, anger w was easier to recognize, w w better recognition among the Anglo people, but not the Asians. Um, and uh, the, the Anglo service providers having more trouble with shame and happiness uh, in confusion Asian uh, customers. Hence, um, uh, emotion recognition ability is, is crucial to, to have the service industry functioning. So, so th this is a very important, um, I would say, economic uh, ec uh, consequence of the kind of research that we are uh, interested in. Um, th there is a groundbreaking study uh, on this by Ellen Rintel, 90, 80, 1984, um, who had actors play out uh, emotions, both basic and secondary emotions. She played them to her ESL students, and they were Spaniards, Arabs, and Chinese. And uh, she discovered that, um, in fact, how well they identified the emotion depended on their level of proficiency. The more proficient, the better they were, as you would expect. But at similar levels of proficiency, there was a cultural effect. The Spaniards did better than the Arabs, but the Spaniards didn't do as well as a control group of uh, American Anglo speakers. And the, the Arabs were in between and the Chinese were at the bottom, uh, having most trouble recognizing this. And I, I met her at a conference and I said, you know, that's such an interesting design. How, how did you come, come up with it? I said, oh, well, I happened to share uh, an office with a psychologist. And we got talking and both of us were interested in emotion. And he said, well, you know, we could do this. And so he, they, they produced something that none of them could have produced on, on their own, which is, again, why it's so good to be uh, working with colleagues from different uh, disciplines. So go ahead. No, they, 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 they weren't rating any particular element. They were asked to identify which emotion was being played out in an audio recording. In an audio recording. Um, I didn't hear the recordings myself. I just read uh, the paper. And so um, it, it inspired me to uh, set up a new research design with a, a Belgian colleague, uh, Pernel Lorette. And, and the, the paper is currently under submission. Um, and um, thank you. 
for forwarding the call to participate uh, in that um, research. Um, so we had, um, uh, in the end, 356 L1 users of English, uh, 564 foreign language users of English. We uh, asked uh, participants to identify emotions played out uh, by an, uh, Ka Karen Glossop from Camden Theatre, and professional British actress. In fact, uh, bilingual uh, Latvian English, but dominant in English. Um, she produced uh, one minute, about one minute clips of every basic emotion. And so the, the instruction was what emotion uh, is being uh, portrayed. And uh, there was also a lexical test in English so that we could have an idea of uh, the, the level of English of, of the participants. Um, so we wondered, would there be a difference between the first language and the foreign language users? What would be your guess? Yes, yeah? I mean, that's a reasonable assumption considering Rintel's finding and, and other findings that confirmed it. Uh, would there be a, a link between proficiency and emotion recognition ability? Yes, good guess. Would there be an effect of L1 culture? I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. turning into David Goleman. I'll ask a serious fee at the end. Um, is there, would there be an effect of L1 culture? Yes. Yes, okay. Now, this is the brilliant thing about research. You, you have this, uh, you, no, you, you think, oh, this must be yes. And then the results come out. And well, first, th th this is how the responses were distributed. So most people had four out of six right, yeah? Nobody had zero, and um, about 100 had all six uh, right. Um, and then what was the result? No difference no. at all between the L1 users and the LX users. And, and we, we, we couldn't believe this, so we checked everything, and you know, we, we triple checked. Uh, all the data, making sure that, you know, that there weren't people from the wrong category, etc. But there was no difference. Well, as you see, the, the, the standard deviation is, is bigger uh, for the LX users, as you would expect, but uh, the mean is exactly, uh, exactly the same. So th this was rather surprising. Um, another one was, yes, indeed, those with higher levels of proficiency um, were significantly better. And was there an effect? of L1 culture? The, the answer was yes, but uh, not, not as pronounced as we had hoped. Uh, notably, the Europeans, as you see, um, had scores that were similar uh, to uh, the, the Brits and the North Americans. Uh, and the only group that had significantly lower scores were the Asians. So that kind of confirmed uh, Rintel's uh, work. So we, we wondered then, why, why didn't we find a difference between L1 and LX users? And I think that, that maybe it's fa the fact that we used audio, visual. So, so you had both visual and audio input. So we, we are repeating the experiment now with only audio. If you don't have the face, would, you would the difference between the L1 and LX users be bigger? Because if you don't understand everything, or you miss some cues in, in the, the speech output, maybe you know, the face helps you, uh, which is why it's so hard to be on the phone in a foreign language, because you don't see the, 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 the person you're talking to doesn't see how, how to totally lost uh, you, you are. So we're waiting to see um, what uh, that will get, say, give. So the, the research I, I did with uh, Aneta after our corpus research, we thought it would be interesting to have uh, data uh, from a larger group of multilinguals uh, from around uh, the world. And uh, so we, we used probably one of the first online questionnaires. The bilingualism and emotion questionnaire was online for two years. Um, it focused on language perception, language choice, to express feelings, anger, swearing. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> self-perceived proficiency and anxiety. And what we found was that um, the, the L1 of our multilinguals was typically the preferred language to express emotion in, and they felt that that was the most, the, the, long, the language with the strongest uh, connotations um, and, and the most resonance and foreign languages typically scored lower. There, there, was lots of, there were lots of variables uh, involved and it's the stuff I discuss uh, in the book, like uh, people's linguistic history, played a role, present language use, 
uh, social, some social biographical uh, variables. Typically, if you started learning the foreign language later in life, it didn't feel quite as emotional. You wouldn't use that language as much uh, for swearing, for example. If you had learned a language um, only through formal instruction at school, that language typically didn't have the same emotional weight uh, that languages had if you learned the language at school, but you also use it outside school, or if you learn the language naturalistically. With, and it's something we discussed yesterday. You, you have richer emotional connotations. Context of learning is obviously uh, important. Then you won't be surprised that people using a foreign language more are better, uh, are more confident, are more likely to use that language to express emotions in. Um, also, if you're more socialized in that language, you have more people you are using that language with, a wider variety of registers that you are uh, exposed to. And then there was straight emotional intelligence, um, which turned out to be linked only to um, la language anxiety, both in the, foreign, in the first and all the foreign languages, with people scoring higher on uh, emotional intelligence, uh, scoring lower on anxiety. The, the explanation, I think, is that if you have more emotional intelligence and you are better able to assess the emotional state of your interlocutor, you don't worry too much uh, about not getting through because you say, okay, that person is happy. You, you can adjust according to the, feed, the, the feedback you get from uh, your interlocutor. If you have more difficulty in establishing whether your interlocutor is happy or not happy, then it makes you more fearful that you might not be getting through and that you might not be obtaining your goals. But it was not linked to any language preference or attitudes towards languages or uh, swearing or uh, self-perceived proficiency or anything. Um, then th this was the typical kind of finding um, on, I asked, you know, what, what's the emotional force of uh, the sentence, I love you, in your different languages? And the same for the swear words in your different languages. And as you see, always the same pattern, strongest in the first language, uh, weakest in languages learned later in life. Then why is the first language more emotional? And uh, Aneta looked into this and um, looked at the literature. And, and it's, it's probably to do with uh, effective linguistic conditioning that we have as children. Uh, we learn the language with full involvement of the limbic system, emotional memory. So we remember people using language in a certain way and, and, and or, or us using language inappropriately and being told off by teacher or parent, etc. So it, it, it stays there. If you learn a language sitting on a chair in a classroom, you are using a different memory system. You're using declarative memory. It, the, the emotional connotations will be much weaker um, and, and it will feel detached and, and, and disembodied. However, if you <laughs> fall in love with the speaker of that language and you move to that person's country, then obviously that language will become emotionally more uh, resonant uh, to you. Um, so, so the L1 is typically the, the language of the heart, but, but it can change. So it's not a law of nature. And I think that's uh, an important uh, point. Um, now, not everybody gets it right. Th this is sales in Japan. This is definitely not sales at Harrods in London. <laughs> yeah? Exactly. So, so, so it, 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 the shop manager thought that this was OK, I guess. You, you know? <laughs> and certainly it attracts attention. <laughs> um, and, uh, but but I, I won't say too much about swearing, but, but it's a rich area because we, we, we have different experiences of swear words uh, in our uh, foreign languages. So um, the questionnaire I did with Aneta had 34 questions. We asked uh, all, all the necessary background uh, information. Uh, we had 1,400 participants, more females than males, lots of languages, um, lots of people with high levels of education uh, and, and, and being multilingual. Average age, 35. And I thought this was interesting because they are not language learners, which are typically the people that you find in, in, uh, as participants in, in research. These were adult foreign language users. So that was um, an important uh, point. And then because questionnaires are limited, you know, 
um, it, it, they can be frustrating if you fill out questionnaires as you have had. You say, why don't they ask the crucial question? So it's good to have some open questions to allow people to vent their uh, anger at your questionnaire. It's also good to, to interview people and ask a, a small selection, okay, tell me more. You said you never swear in that language. I don't believe you. And when you do that, they, they say, well, yes, you're right. In fact, yes, I, I, I do. <laughs> and and, and uh, so, so you, you get kind of richer data. And I think it's nice to combine questionnaire stuff with, from large samples because you get general trends. And then you can start focusing on people who don't conform to the trends and then try and find out why they diverge from the, the, the trend. Um, so what one, we had also questions on code switching uh, and emotion. We asked, you know, if you uh, switch between, do you switch between languages uh, within a conversation with certain people? We had categories of interlocutor. Obviously, lots of people complained about that, and I agree with them. They said, well, with some friends, yes, with other friends, no. Same with colleagues, so, so I, I agree. But if you ask questions, you know, you, 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 you have to kind of make some abstractions uh, for, for, of categories. Uh, does it matter what you are, how emotional the topic of conversation is? So what do you think? Do you think there is more code switching with certain interlocutors than with others? Yeah. Yes. Your bet, yes. yes. Yeah, yes. sounds like a good bet. Um, do, do you think, depending on the matter, or the topic of the topic of conversation, you would code switch more? Yes. Where, where would you code switch more? Do you think? Ah, okay. That, that, that seems to be relatively low in emotional content, uh, uh, unless there is... It's something that happens with everyday... Right. Uh, everyday occurrences. Um, so, 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 so out of number one, two, or three, where, where do you think you code switch more? Three? Yeah? Well, well uh, th there were... They, they were yeah, th three possibilities, neutral, personal, or emotional. To switch from which language to which language? Uh, we, 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 we didn't ask that. We, we said, do you code switch more? But we didn't, uh, we, we asked about direction in our interviews, uh, but, but not in, in the questionnaire because it's too complicated. So I could imagine that if you have a bilingual family where they speak one language at home yeah. and the kids come to school, True. where they're experiencing True. the other language, and yeah. they get emotional about more personal. True. Yep, no, nope, that, that's an excellent point. Yeah, I, I agree. We, since we only had two items on code switching, we couldn't go into that amount of detail. But, but you could do just that, and I, I agree, that would be a good point. But, but this was the answer, yes, there is a clear, uh, you, you, you code switch most with your friends, and, and least so in public, which is kind of logical, because you need to know the languages that the person or the people you are talking to share with you. So, so you won't switch if you don't know whether we share uh, languages. Um, the other finding was that, in fact, about when you talk about emotional stuff, multilinguals switch more. Um, the right, but so, so it, yeah, I mean, sometimes it's nice when you think, ah, okay, th this is not new. But, but maybe th this is new in a sense that it wasn't, Lebov wasn't working on a multilingual uh, context. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. The vernacular. Yeah, vernacular use. Uh, I got something very curious in my family. You know, my husband, he speaks in Austria, and he speaks a dialect mm -hmm. in Dutch. And uh, for him, I mean, when he met other parents of the German school, you know, who were German, and um, it was easier for him to switch from Spanish. I mean, they share, but for those who uh -huh. Spanish, they are in hospital. You know, in yeah, 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 yeah. Sure. Relaxation sure. The, the code, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and then the common code can be abandoned in cases of strong emotions. We had participants saying, oh, you know, my, I, I speak, I have Berber as a first language, but my partner doesn't speak Berber. But when I get really angry, I only swear in Berber. <laughs> and, and you guess that the partner has learned these words by then, <laughs> uh, or at least to. To, to recognize them. So, so yeah, no, this was uh, an interesting um, uh, answer to um, 
the question about why do you code switch? And, and, and this was a South American uh, participant. Spanglish is my language of preference. The person who just cut me off on the highway is a fucking pendejo. <laughs> now, now, I understand that pendejo is not a, a word used in Spain. No, no, no. Yeah? But you recognize it. It's Mexican. Ah, it's Mexican. Not in Argentina. Not, not in Argentina. Yeah, but it has a different meaning. But that, that meaning is Mexican. Me Mexican, yeah. S S Central America also. Yeah. Ah, excellent. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I quite like that combination. Um, and and then th that that participant was really poetic in, in the sense, you know, <laughs> terms of endearment fluctuate between Spanish and English. I prefer Spanish for emotional terms. Because if you want to punctuate it with a harsher tone, just add an English <laughs> word. But <laughs> apparently not. All, I, I don't know whether it's only the F word or, or any other ones. Um, my theory with languages, English is just like an apple tart and crunchy and good for certain things. Spanish like passion fruit, sweet tart, runny, but uh, with seeds, so that's good to express everything. So, so th this is a poet. <laughs> this is great. Um, and then th this is an interesting case. Uh, Michelle, a Chinese native speaker, been living in London for about 15 years when she was interviewed. And on the questionnaire, she said, I never swear. And uh, my research uh, assistant uh, didn't believe her. I said, oh, come on, Michelle, I, I don't believe it. Uh, and she said, no, 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 I don't, because, you know, in English, um, you speak like emotions in Chinese. I don't feel comfortable, but it's, it's, there are cultural differences between English uh, and, and uh, Chinese. Uh, and, and I don't swear. Um, but um, when Benedetta insisted, she said, well, yeah, in fact, I do swear, when I'm with my friends, my Chinese friends, um, we, we say things like, oh, shoot, <laughs> or, or sugar, uh, or whatever, and, then, and we say that in English. I say, aha, so you are talking, uh, using Chinese, but swearing in English. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and, and so, so that, I thought, was a very endearing, nice example of acc acculturation. They, she probably didn't swear at all. Uh, when she arrived in London, or maybe after the first two years, but after a while, she started using, oh shoot, I, I don't know whether she has graduated to the heavier stuff um, <laughs> by now. <coughs> uh, and then uh, another interesting aspect, uh, Vali, who said that when I talk about emotional topics, I switch to English a lot, and she's a Greek native speaker. Uh, I remember when I was seeing a psychologist in Greece, I kept code switching from Greek to English, we never talked about this, is it a distancing strategy? And I thought, that's so interesting. And um, the, 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 the book w w fell in the hands of um, uh, a psychotherapist, her name is Beverly Costa, who contacted me and said, you know, this is interesting. I, I want to look at this uh, in more uh, specifically in code switching uh, in psychotherapy. And so uh, there, there uh, it is. So we did some uh, research on that. Um, Finally, the paper got, uh, that was a serious award. I also got an award for the most obscene title. But, but th that, I don't want to mention that. Uh, th this is an award I'm prouder of. So we, we interviewed, well, we collected data from 101 um, therapists. 19 of them were monolingual, the other were multilingual. We used a mixed method approach, online questionnaire, interviewed one monolingual and two monolingual therapists. And uh, one of the things we found was that there was a significant difference between the monolinguals and multilinguals in the sense that the multilingual therapists were closer to the attunement end of a dimension um, compared to the monolingual therapists. And um, in, in the interviews, we tried to find out why that was. And um, so we tried to uh, understand their views and uncover possible causes for patterns. Now, you have to, I don't know whether you've worked on psychotherapy, it's, it's really hard to get data because of uh, confidentiality issues. So, so the online questionnaires are, are quite, you know, you throw them open and you hope that some people will answer and then she used uh, co her contacts to um, interview a couple of, of colleagues. But, but it, it, there are ethical nightmares uh, if you want to go there. And, and one of them, the next study, we focused on uh, f clients or, or, or <coughs> patients, but apparently you have to call them clients. Um, and uh, through an online questionnaire, 182 uh, filled out uh, our questionnaire. We had, again, Likert scales and open questions, and uh, w we found three main 
uh, themes, namely that multilingualism of the therapist promotes uh, greater empathic uh, understanding. And this is the kind of thing that is totally ignored by NHS. Uh, you know, they train psychotherapists, but they never tell them that they might be having clients from that are not native speakers of English, and that that might have a crucial effect on the therapy, and that you need to take that into account. So this is the kind of the message that we are trying to um, get to, to um, authorities and, and, and the NHS. Um, so the, the clients view their multilingualism as a crucial aspect of their self, uh, and the, the language switching uh, is highly relevant uh, for interpretation because uh, they uh, report uh, that we found that th there is more switching when the emotional tone is raised, especially when clients talking about trauma that happened to them and, and these include torture or rape or horrible stuff. Uh, there is more uh, switching and the switching can allow people to take distance or, or proximity depending on what they need at that very moment. So, so this is really highly relevant for a psychotherapist to be able to recognize that and interpret that uh, adequately. So um, to conclude, it's hard to deal with being emotional in a foreign language and very often also you have an avalanche of strong emotions and feelings that you want to verbalize and you, you can't get it uh, into the foreign language uh, quickly enough. So uh, or maybe also because your emotion concepts are incomplete in that foreign language and you may have unwanted uh, effects. Or, and and I, I see it as the, the bottleneck of the weaker language. You can't push your full emotion through so you, it might spill over and you might use uh, another language uh, instead. Um, so, um, second language, foreign language acquisition is an emotional journey. Uh, I think it's crucial to foster positive emotions. It's hard to um, communicate them, uh, to recognize them. Uh, it has real world consequences. Uh, I think w m more the, the, the curriculum, uh, foreign language curriculum is, is amazingly free of emotion speech. You know, the, 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 the most emotional phrase I could find in my daughter's French book was la soupe est froide. Oh, uh, and it, 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 uh, it exactly, and it didn't specify whether it was maybe in Spain where the gazpacho is supposed to be called. So, so, the, um, so, uh, and and the thing is, it's a fun topic, and there is so much more to investigate. So, so this is really something that I'm 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 quite happy uh, looking uh, into. So, thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for this very interesting and uh, and I think that you were very successful in arousing emotions ah, in all of good. us <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and also in uh, keeping this positive flow alive you know Ooh, to where you were speaking about because mm. uh, I it was also nice to see the connection between emotion and humor you know because this is mm. another of the things that we want Absolutely. to to um, research in our project, humor and irony in connection with mm -hmm. emotion, which mm -hmm. we think this, this mm -hmm. is a big link there. And, uh, and so, mm, uh, well, uh, I'm I wanted to ask you several things, but one of them is uh, when you speak about the positive flow and you said that the results that, uh, you know, the more emotions, the, the more positive flow in the class, mm. how, I'm going to ask you a, a question similar to what you asked uh, yesterday about emotional intelligence. How do you measure the positive flow? We, we are in the questionnaire, we had um, a question that said, um, what proportion of time in your foreign language classroom or, or do, do you forget where you are and, and, and who you are? So mm -hmm. are you in a state of positive flow? So it was percentage of time. So, okay, so the positive flow was proportional to the percentage of time in which the, yes. the yes. student had lost uh, yeah. uh, consciousness of the fact yeah. that he was and in a class. Okay. Telling you, right? Yeah. yeah. Which may or not oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's always the case with, uh, with self-report. You have to rely on what they're saying, but they could be lying to you, but then you would, in fact, have to interview them to check. And even then, I mean, flow is a subjective, you, you cannot measure it. So you have to rely on self-report. Yeah. So that, that's, that's well, I mean, the I, tough I thing about the emotions, you know, that sometimes uh, you know, it's difficult to measure things. Yeah. And, right. And then 
Just a question. Do you think that then we can be emotionally bilingual or trilingual, or do we we become just a hybrid and then, uh, or you can code swift, I mean, shift in e emotions, emotionally. That is to say, if you speak one language, then you behave emotionally appropriately according to, or you have this hybrid attitude that you spoke about yesterday. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I think we, we are, we develop various stages of hybridity and we can, we, I, I think we move on a continuum. Uh, I, I think it can move on a continuum towards being more Belgian than and, and, and on in, in the UK, I'm obviously immediately uh, identified as being a, for a bloody foreigner uh, <laughs> or, or a European. Are you a European? So I can behave in a more British way, I guess, and I can behave in a more Belgian way, but then there are some things that you do not control. So some mm -hmm. things you do consciously, some things happen to you unconsciously, and I don't remember who I was talking to. Um, uh, when, when I joined the department at Bergbeck, uh, I realized that at uh, parties, um, the, the person I was uh, speaking to was constantly walking backwards. And, and, and I kept walking <laughs> forwards, not realizing that I was invading their private space. That in the UK, your one arm length is, is the space where you stand talking to someone. In Belgium, it's half an arm length. So, so it, it took me a while before I realized that and shaking hands too often. Uh, and, and trying to kiss people, they go <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> 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 uh, and then I went back to Belgium at a reception. Uh, lo last year it was a reception and, and people were standing there and I was the one. Stepping back. Thinking, yes. oh, I smell your breath. Oh, <laughs> oh, keep away. So I thought, oh God, I've, 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 I've become British. <laughs> or at least partly. So, so, so you know, you, you, you switch a little bit uh, between contexts, I guess. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for this very interesting and um, nice talk. And so, if there are any questions. I was quite intrigued by the psychotherapy data. Mm -hmm. Because there is quite recent research by um, Celia Roberts, and she's looked at the training that people receive when they want to become GPs in the UK. Mm -hmm. And there is a part where they have to interact with a pseudo patient and tell them very sensitive things. Yes. And apparently, foreigners speaking in English scored really badly on empathy in these cases, and they many of them failed the whole training due to not being able to communicate with a patient. Now, of course, in a place like London, half of your patients won't want to be English anyway. Mm. So I think your study would very nicely complement what, what's, what's being found there, because people find themselves at a, at a disadvantage being judged from a very monolingual British perspective. Ab absolutely. In a, in a professional way, you could actually enrich the process by, by being multilingual. Yeah, mm. yeah. So, so it, it would help, for example, then to, to point out how, how you express, how you recognize signs of empathy by, by your interlocutor, um, because they are obviously different in different cultures. Yeah. Um, so so I, I guess that these foreign language GPs might just not pick up the, what is too subtle, maybe, for, for them to understand, ooh, th this, this is, in fact, pretty serious where in another culture it would have been stated more bluntly. Or I, I also realize how hard it is for, for our Asian, and, uh, Asian students uh, in, uh, in, in Western universities, uh, you know, considering how different emotions are expressed and, and other ac academic expectations, how, how hard it is and how, you, you know, it, it, it's good to realize that we shouldn't be too Eurocentric, but therefore we need to understand what Eurocentric is in, in certain context of communication. And, and I think that's crucial for anyone dealing with, with well, I employing foreign language users uh, or dealing with foreign language users. Hmm. In the same line, but just the way around, I was curious about uh, whether you, you have any contact, any psychologist or something, who has trained or knows of uh, professional spies and people who shouldn't show any sign of emotion, for example, to face the lie detector and the like, you know. Yeah. So this would be very interesting as well. Well, the, the, and, and the culturally bound. Yes. Uh, in fact, uh, Aneta Pavlenko has um, recently um, testified uh, in the defense of one of uh, the people accused of the Boston, the Boston bombing. 
um, where they had um, a, used a lie detector with, with a guy who w was reasonably proficient in English, but not that proficient. And then they used lie detector findings to draw all kinds of conclusions that might have been okay had he been a native speaker of English, but he wasn't. And hence, they drew all the wrong conclusions. And, and <laughs> well, well, yeah, uh, the, the thing is that if you're a non-native user of a language, you react differently for different reasons. Also because you, you are thinking hard or you are getting nervous, I won't, God, I won't get this right. It will show on the lie detector, not because you are lying, but it, because you, you are involved in something that you, you know, you're anxious. Uh, and, and, and hence, they get to rubbish conclusions using methods that are not applicable on foreign language users. So this is another real world uh, application of, of emotion research, really. Mm. Just one more, because we have running short of time. So Eva, you, you're pleased I didn't use too many swear words, right? <laughs> <laughs> Only the fucking sales. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Thank you.